thank you all for joining us today for What's Up King Tut. Uh, my name is Calgary and I am the Youth and Family Program Manager at the OI. And uh, also helping out today will be Charlie, who is the lead facilitator. So they'll be here today too. All right, so I think we'll get started. And then just a reminder, if you uh, want to do the craft with us today, we're going to be using pencil, paper, and a box. All right, so our program today, What's Up King Tut? So we are looking at the famous king from Egypt. And then first off, just to get us started, go ahead and put in the chat, who was King Tut? Just any ideas you already have about him. Uh, who was he? And then why is King Tut so famous? So those are the two questions if you have an answer for uh, who is King Tut? And why is he so famous? So he's a king. Yep, awesome. A boy king, I see. An Egyptian pharaoh. Awesome. Some question marks, we're not sure. That's okay. Uh, king of Egypt when he was nine or ten. Awesome. Young king. And then how about, why is he so famous? I see a lot of jewels in his tomb, definitely. Cool, a king. All right, so it looks like we already know a little bit about King Tut, um, but, and we know he was a king, he was a boy king, and he's famous for a lot of jewels maybe, and because his tomb was hard to find. Um, so how do we know about King Tut's life and what do we know about him? So to investigate some of that, um, we're going to look into what King Tut's story, what's his story, what's his deal? Uh, so for that, Charlie is going to share a story with us about King Tut. So I'll stop sharing and then Charlie can take it away. Hi everyone. So I'm gonna be telling you guys a story about King Tut who in the chat, you guys mentioned that he was a young king and we're just gonna be talking about his life today. I'm Tutankhamun, the real story of ancient Egypt's most famous child king. Hi there, let me introduce myself. I'm Tutankhamun the most famous child king or child pharaoh of ancient Egypt. You can call me Tut, everyone now does nowadays. I'm here to tell you all sorts of interesting stuff about myself. I have to warn you though, I can only reveal what Egyptologists, the scientists who study ancient Egypt say about me. I'm so completely awesome that Egyptologists are still studying me, even though I can't tell you anything they haven't already discovered, or at least their latest theories, don't worry. I still have plenty to say about myself. Ancient Egypt's most famous child king, in case you already forgot who I am. Let's start with my name. Do you know what your name means? Mine, ma mine means living image of Amun. Amun was the name of the, one of the most important Egyptian gods when I was alive on earth. Please pay careful attention to that Amun part. You'll see why later. I was born in Egypt in 1332 BCE. That's over 3,100 years ago. 3,300 years ago. Your modern Egyptologists sure have had a hard time figuring out my family. They are pretty sure my father was Akhenaten, but they aren't certain about my mother. After all, most ancient Egyptian pharaohs had several wives. Of course, I know who my mother was. Egyptologists, though, still don't agree. They haven't found any written proof. The genetic research on my family's mummies hasn't provided a definite answer either. And you know, I can't tell you. My father, Akhenaten, is really fascinating to Egyptologists. He proclaimed that all of Egypt should worship Aten, pictured as the round disk of the sun as the main god, instead of Amun. He changed all our royal names, starting with his own name, Amenhotep IV, which honored the god Amun. He became Akhenaten. And he turned the country completely upside down. He, pr he fired the priests of Amun, built a new capital city, Amarna, destroyed old temples, and made everyone say new prayers. Then, after about 17 years as pharaoh, he docked his boat in the harbor, or as you would say, he died. Since it seems all I had were sisters, six of them, and the pharaoh had to be a male, except for a very few exceptions, which is a story for another time, I appeared on the throne, just like the sun does on the eastern horizon. That means, like all pharaohs, when I became king, I was considered to be the representative of the god Horus on the earth. I was only nine years old. Of course, I was scared and not sure what to do. I was too young to know how to rule Egypt. Luckily, I had advisors to help me. 
My advisors did not agree with my father. They declared that everyone should worship a moon, not a ten, as Idris' most important god. To make that clear, they changed all the royal names back again. I went from being Tutankhaten, living image of a ten, to Tutankhamun, living image of a moon. See, I told you to pay attention to the Amun part of my name. My advisors also removed every sign of, the fa of my father they could. They chiseled away his names and images, they destroyed his new temples and buildings, and then they reused his special carved stone blocks called tala talatats, now for their own new buildings all over Egypt. While my advisors ran the country, I did what royal children usually did. I learned how to lead Egypt's armies, I was part of religious ceremonies worshiping a moon, and I learned to read hieroglyphs, something only one out of every hundred of my subjects could do. I had to memorize hundreds and hundreds of hieroglyphic signs. The English alphabet has only 26 letters. You are so lucky. And thank goodness I had fun too. I went hunting big animals that lived in the Nile like hippopotamuses and crocodiles. When I could, I goofed off with my sisters. Sometimes we played a board game called Senate. You can bet I always won. Then when I was around 12, I got married. As yucky as it may seem to you, like many ancient Egyptian pharaohs, I married someone whose scholars think was probably my half-sister. Her name was Akasanan Moon. She was older than me, but you can be sure she couldn't boss me around because I was king. I ruled until I was 18. That's how old I was when I docked my boat in the harbor. You remember that means I died. Some Egyptologists think I fell off my chariot. My, I might have had trouble standing on the chariot because I had a twisted foot. Maybe I hit my head or broke my leg and got an infection that killed me. We didn't even have antibiotics like you have today. Or maybe I had malaria. No Egyptologist knows how I died. Now think for a moment. Am I the only ancient Egyptian pharaoh you've ever heard of except maybe a Ramses or two? It's sort of crazy because I have to confess, and this is embarrassing, I was not a very important pharaoh. The Egyptian priests ne even left my name off their list of pharaohs. Not long after I was buried, the entrance to my tomb was completely covered over somehow, maybe by a landslide. Later, Egyptians even built huts for tomb workers over my tomb entrance. That's probably one more reason people flat out forgot about me. Out of sight, out of mind. So how did I get to be so famous? Here's the reason. Finally, after 3,000 th 3, years, and that's a very long time, I got lucky. In modern times, Egyptologists began to do archaeology in Egypt. Some of them began to suspect I had existed, but no one knew where my tomb was until Howard Carter, an English e Egyptologist who was excavating in the Valley of the Kings, found objects, Egypt's, Egypt, eh, found objects, archaeologists call them artifacts, with my name on them. The artifacts convinced him my tomb was nearby. Carter and his workers dug around the Valley of the Kings for over five years looking for me. Finally, in 1922, Carter's water boy, Hussein Abdul Rasul, found a single stone step of the kind that led to important burial sites. This step turned out to be the first of the, stair first of the stairs down to my tomb's sealed door. Why was finding my tomb so amazing? Get this, my tomb is one of the few ancient Egyptian royal tombs that has ever been found intact without being stolen from or destroyed. Tomb robbers stole everything of value from almost every single one of the tombs of the other kings of ancient Egypt, probably very soon after those kings were buried. Maybe there are some advantages to being forgotten for 3,000 years after all. Many of the things in my tomb were in a jumble. Tomb robbers had tried to break in twice, but they were caught almost immediately. Both times, the priests had my tomb carefully sealed up again. Because I died suddenly, my tomb had to be prepared quickly. Still, it contained many of my favorite things, made of gold, ivory, and other precious materials. After all, when I was alive, I lived in luxury. Even after the robbers took what they could, my tomb contained over 5,000 objects in all. Jewels and amulets were wrapped onto the linen bandages around my body, and my mummy was placed inside three coffin cases. One of the cases was solid gold and weighed 2,248 pounds. That's over a ton. It's about time for me to go, but before I do, I want to clear up something important. You may have heard about the curse of King Tut. People said my mummy cursed Lord Carnivoran of the English Lord who gave Howard Carter the money for his excavations. That silly rumor is not true. Lord Carnivoran, Carnarvon 
did die soon after my tomb was discovered, but I'm not responsible. Without Carnivaron and Carter, I wouldn't be famous, would I? Now we've come to the end of my story as Egyptologists know it, or did when this was written anyhow, and it's time for me to say goodbye. I lived for only 18 years, but ancient Egypt, Egypt existed along the Nile River in Africa for more than 30 centuries. That's 3,000 years. I would be thrilled if you would be interested in learning more. You might even decide to become an Egyptologist and study, well, who else but me? If you do, and you make new discoveries about my life, maybe you too will become famous, but not as famous as me. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoy it. That was the story of King Tut. Thank you very much, Charlie. Uh, all right, I'm going to share my screen again. But before I do, I see that uh, Kipling has their hand raised. So I'm asking you to unmute if you want to ask your question or make your comment. So you can go I ahead really liked, um, my favorite king was King Tut. Awesome. Cool. Well, I'm glad that you're here today to learn a little bit more about him. So now that we've heard the story of King Tut, uh, let's see if we can kind of revisit those questions. So who was King Tut? What do we think now? You can go ahead and put your answers in the chat again. Um, and then how do we know about him? And would you want to be King Tut? Are you, would you be interested in being him? So do you have any thoughts about those questions? You can put those in the chat as well and let us know. So still here, yep, he was a king. So we know, we've got that down, awesome. King died when he was 18, so he died very young. Some people were guessing that he died when he was young uh, as well, so they're right about that. Somebody said they would wanna be King Tut. So yeah, probably would be pretty cool to be a pharaoh, even if it was short-lived. Somebody would not. So I can see that too. He was the son of Akhenaten, so that's an important part. We know about him because of Howard Carter and Egyptologists in general. Awesome. All right. So now we know about King Tut because of his tomb that was discovered um, untouched since ancient times. Uh, so we're going to talk about how we know about him from his artifacts. And the first thing that we are going to share uh, is the story that Tut's statue tells. So if you've ever been to the OI, you've probably seen this statue here, this monumental or huge statue of King Tut uh, in our galleries. And we're going to see what we can learn about this king from this picture. So first off, we're gonna all grab one of our pieces of paper that we have and your pencil, and we're gonna make some observations about this statue. So one of the ways that archeologists learn about artifacts and about ancient people is by making observations. So they notice things um, and they make, they, they say what they notice. So we're gonna practice observing by drawing first. So we're gonna sketch the statue of King Tut so you can either sketch the whole statue or just his head, because there's a lot going on there. Uh, and don't worry if you're not a good, if you don't think you're a good artist or you don't like drawing, this is just a way to get us to pay close attention and look at things. So uh, just start sketching what you see. And as you're sketching, see if you start to notice anything interesting, maybe something you didn't see when you first looked at this picture. And uh, as you're noticing things, you can either make a mental note uh, or you could make a note on your paper or draw like an arrow to something interesting you see. And after a minute of this, we're gonna uh, share some of our ideas about the statue and talk about it. But let's just, first we're just gonna see what we notice. And archeologists do lots of drawings when they're working in the field too. That's one of the ways they make recordings of things. And even today, Egyptologists um, do a special study of monuments and hieroglyphs where they draw very detailed pictures of them. Question. Of course. Yes, whoever is, had the question, go ahead. Is, the, is King Tut, that statue, um, the tallest statue that you have in the OI? 
Uh, yes, I think it is the tallest statue in the line. It's 17 feet tall. The only other one that could be taller, but I don't think it is, is our Lomasu, who is a big human-headed bull. The bull does seem pretty big. It is pretty big. But I think he is maybe the tallest Egyptian statue in maybe east of the Mississippi River in the United States. So he's this is a pretty big, big statue of him. All right, so as we keep sketching, if you notice anything interesting or you have a question about something on this statue, go ahead and tell me in the chat uh, what you're wondering about, what you see, just anything that strikes you as interesting or odd. It's old. Let's see. Aiden, you have a question. You can go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Well, I just want to say that it's a little odd because and these, these statues were made thousands of years ago. Oh, and but how did they make this super elaborate uh, sculpture or such as King Tut? That's a great question. So yeah, how did they make something this uh, elaborate and this big in the ancient world? So we'll get to that. That's a great question. I have a question. Go for it. What's the thing behind King Tut? Like, what's the thing that's like? It looks like it's on top of his head. Yeah. What's yeah, on what's top the of? of yeah, so this the, part. the part that's on top of his head, like this. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So what's he wearing on his head? That's a great thing to notice, and we'll talk about that. We have some questions about the hieroglyphs. Okay. So I think we've got a good start here. We're noticing some interesting things. So let's take a close look. Uh, at his statue together now. Um, and before we get into the nitty gritty of his statue and talk about what's on his head and how they made it, I want us to all just first stand up and we're gonna pose like King Tut in this picture, all right? So go ahead and stand up in front of your computer and then we're gonna stand like King Tut. So he's got his chin up, he's got his arms at his sides, right? They're kind of in fists. He's got one leg forward, he's stepping forward, very powerful. So shoulders back, how do you feel in this pose? Just think about how you feel. Do you feel confident, strong? Do you feel tough? You could sit down as soon as you've just thought about how you feel. Strong and confident. Strong and confident, awesome. Any other thoughts? Did anybody, probably nobody felt weak or uh, scared, right? So it's a very strong pose, uh, which kind of, which makes sense. You want to have a strong looking king. Um, but also we know that King Tut was a boy king. Um, he probably wasn't all that strong and tough, uh, but they're making him look that way, which is interesting. All right, so let's take a look at the stuff on his head. So first off, we have this crown and it's a two part crown here. We've got this bottom part here. So this is going to be the uh, crown of Upper Egypt. And then inside, the part that kind of looks like a bowling pin is the crown of Lower Egypt. And so they had two crowns uh, that represented different parts of Egypt, and he's wearing both to show that he is king uh, of both parts of Egypt. And then, oops, sorry, let's see. I'm trying to erase my drawings. All right. Up here, we have this cobra on his head. This was a magical snake that called a uraeus that would uh, like protect the king from anybody who might try to harm him and also showed that he had magical powers over uh, nature. Uh, Melissa Tobler, did you have a question? Uh, I don't actually, know. Actually, 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 Melissa Toba is my mom's <laughs> name. My name is Robert Toba. Your name's Robert. I guess that that was probably your mom's name. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, no questions. Okay. And then T.S., oh, did you uh, have a no, question? What's the thing she, no, what's the thing he's wearing? What's the thing, he, what's the thing he, he's wearing? So what else is he wearing? Yeah. yeah. 
So let's go through it. So after the snake, we see he's got this headdress thing here, right? Oops, that's all stripey coming out of his head. So this is called a nemes headdress, and it was a very common thing to wear in ancient Egypt, uh, especially for the pharaohs. And this one is special because it has stripes on it, and it shows that he's related to the sun god. So it's like he has the rays of the sun coming out of his head. And then we have this weird looking beard here. So if King Tut was a kid when he was king, do you think that he could have grown a beard like that? Probably not, right? I don't see many 18 year olds walking around with a big beard like that. And in fact, it is not a real beard. So King Tut, like lots of pharaohs, wore a false beard or a fake beard that also represented that he was a god. So it shows his divinity, um, his relationship to the god Osiris specifically. Um, and yeah, all of the pharaohs wore them, even pharaohs who are women wore these. And you can't see it in this picture, but if you went to the OI, you'd see that he actually has straps shown on his face. So they're not trying to trick us into making us think that this is real. All right, let's keep going on King Tut's statue. We see he's holding something in his hands too, uh, which somebody commented on. So we don't actually know what he's holding in his hands. That's still a mystery. They could be rolls of cloth or scrolls or maybe the handles to a crook and flail. And then we see some hieroglyphs on the bottom, which somebody mentioned, and we do know what they say. We're not gonna go through all of them today, um, but we will talk about them a little bit. And then I wanna just point out something interesting here. So did anybody notice these when they were looking at the statue? So we have these little toes on this statue. So there used to be a person standing next to King Tut on this statue. Uh, so who do you think might have stood on the statue with King Tut a long time ago? Who would be important enough to be on the statue, but maybe not so important? The, the wife that he married. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So these were the feet of his wife, Anka Sanamun. Uh, so she was on the statue with him originally, um, but she was knocked off at some point in ancient times. And she is smaller than him because she's less important, especially in this situation. This statue was from outside of King Tut's uh, temple. So it was a temple just for him. Um, but she was on the statue to show that she still mattered. So that's pretty neat, a neat detail, I think. Um, but let's take a look, all right, at, losing my mouse here. Okay, let's take a look at some of those hieroglyphs now. So going to the back of the statue, there are hieroglyphs on the back. We'll kind of get closer here. These are pictures from our Google Arts tour, so you can walk through the museum and see them. And we have these cartouches on the back of the statue. So they say Jesser Keperu Ra and Horem Heb. And cartouches were a symbol that showed that this was the name of a pharaoh. They were a sort of magical protection uh, for the pharaoh's name. But we don't see King Tut's name here, do we, right? Neither of these say King Tut. And in fact, if we look here, these are actually King Tut's cartouches. So this is Neb Keperu Ra, this is his throne name, and then Tutankhamun, his like personal name. And actually, we think that when this statue was made, uh, it wasn't finished by the time he passed away because he died very suddenly when he was young. And so the next pharaoh who came along his name was I, spelled A-Y-E, and he thought, this is a pretty good statue. There's no reason to waste it. So he had his name put on the statue instead. And then the next pharaoh came along, and his name was Horemheb, and he agreed with I. This is a pretty cool statue. So he had I's name carved off of it and his own name put in I's place. So this is a statue of King Tut, but with the name of two, with someone, two pharaohs after him on it. And this was pretty common uh, to happen in ancient Egypt. So this is another statue we have at the OI, much smaller, um, that has I's name on it, actually. But we think it would have belonged to King Tut or maybe even his father, Akhenaten. So lots of switches happening in the ancient world that Egyptologists have to figure out. All right. And then somebody asked about how the statue was created. And uh, also, a lot of times, I'll get a question about if the statue is real. So the answer is yes and no. Um, the e Egyptians really did create this statue and they must have taken a very, very long time to make it because it is made out of a very, very hard stone that can only be carved with other pieces of that stone. So it would have taken them a long time to do this. 
but they had a lot of resources and a lot of motivation to do it because the king wanted them to. So you can see here's what the original statue looked like. And we have just a, we have his head here, part of his torso and his hat. Uh, and then we can see that there are artists at the OI who started putting it back together. And here it is being hoisted up. And then here we have the kind of semi-restored version where it's all put back up together. The crown is partially restored and then what it looks like today. So this is something that we probably wouldn't do today. This was done back a hundred years ago when the OI was just getting started. I mean, we probably wouldn't restore the statue today. So we wouldn't fix it up and make it look like we think it would have looked. But what do you think? Which one do you prefer? Do you think that it would have been better to leave it as we found it? Or do you like the restored version better? And maybe why or why not? So you can tell me in the chat or if you want to raise your hand and share your thoughts about that. I like the restored version so I could actually see what he looked, he would have looked like. Yeah, so the restored version maybe shows us what he really would have looked like. So that's pretty cool. Any other ideas? Does anybody disagree? Somebody says, leave it be, leave it as they found it. Yeah, maybe this is more honest. Oops, sorry, keep going back. Yeah, so this is sort of a debate in um, Egyptology and archeology span as a whole, um, but we do have it restored for better or for worse, but it's cool to be able to see these photos and see what it looked like when it was discovered as well. All right. So clearly we can learn about King Tut by looking at his statue, but sometimes it can be tricky, right? Sometimes his statue doesn't even have his name on it. Um, so luckily there are other artifacts that we can use to learn about King Tut too. So I'm just gonna share a couple ones that we have in the OI. So over here, we have some artifacts related to his parents or his family. So this is a, a small sculpture of Akhenaten, his father. And we know it's Akhenaten because he has these kind of really kind of funky looking eye and chin shape. So Akhenaten changed the art in ancient Egypt too, not just the religion. And then we also have a bust of Nefertiti. So Nefertiti wasn't his mother, um, but she was another one of the wives of Akhenaten. And um, this is the one we have at the OI. It's a replica of this one, which is the real one in Berlin. And then we also have some dishes from King Tut's tomb. Uh, so these would have been part of his funerary banquet. He would have had a big feast thrown in his honor when they closed up his tomb. And so these are the dishes left over from that. And some of them are even labeled to tell us what was in them, which is pretty neat. So we know what was eaten at his last feast. And then lastly, I'll share this astronomical instrument with you all. It looks pretty simple and plain, but has a cool inscription on it. And this was for measuring how the stars moved at night. And the inscription on it talks about how King Tut was returning Egypt to the ways of the old gods. It has lots of his name repeated on it in cartouches. And then it also says that it's here to replace one of these objects that was donated to the tomb, or sorry, to the temple of Amun by his great grand, or sorry, by his grandfather, Thutmose IV. So he said, I'm replacing the one that my grandfather, Thutmose IV, gave you. Uh, but Thutmose IV was actually his great grandfather. So we think that they were trying to erase the whole generation of his father, basically. Uh, so pretending that uh, Akhenaten never existed so that Egypt could move on because it was such a tough time for ancient Egypt. So when Tut gets erased later, we shouldn't maybe feel too bad for him because he did some erasing himself. All right, so there's lots we can learn about Tut from his tomb uh, and the things we found in it. And there's also a way that we can share with the future uh, kind of following in Tut's lead. So I'm going to turn it over to Charlie and they're going to take us through creating a time capsule. Hi everyone. Um, so we're going to be making a uh, time capsule that's kind of similar to King Tut's own tomb. And so does anyone know what a time capsule is? If you could maybe message me in the chat or message Calgary. Um, what you guys think a time capsule looks like. Maybe some of you guys have made them at school. I know that I made them when I was younger. Um, but usually it's a container uh, and people will put objects in it that are important to them. 
and then they seal it up and either they bury it or they keep it on a shelf or put it somewhere and open it many, many years later. So how is Tut's tomb kind of like a time capsule? Um, if anyone wants to put that in the chat, if they have any ideas. Seeing some of you guys say there's lots of cool stuff in it, definitely. Um, so yeah, as you can see from these pictures, um, there's all these different objects in it. And then this is one of the main ways that we learn about um, King Tut's reign from all these different things. So today we're gonna make our own time capsules, just like King Tut's tomb. So first you wanna find a box and or a container. And if you don't have that, that's okay. I'm gonna be using just this. Um, if you don't have a container, that's all right. You can find one later. Um, just make sure you have a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil. And, and then, then Calgary. Have, oh, oh, sorry. We have, I, I put in the I'm chat. I don't have a box. Stop, stop. That's okay. That's okay. I, I just put in the chat, there is a way to make an origami box. My dad uh, gave me a box. Or you can find one later. That's good. No, well, my dad's giving me a box. That's cool. awesome. <laughs> and if you and don't I have a box, don't worry right now. Uh, you can find one later or after the program. And I also have this King Tut. Um, wait, I can't. This is a King Tut tomb toy. It's it's missing the back because you can't find it. Cool. That's awesome. And then Ella M, do you have a question? I see your hand raised. Uh, well, Ella, if you think of your question, we're just going to keep going and uh, we can come back to you. Or just message me and we'll take your question. Um, but so everyone hopefully has a piece of paper and a pen or pencil. And we're going to start by writing a letter to future archaeologists. So this will go in your time capsule. And we just want to kind of think about um, if there was an archaeologist that found this box 100 years in the future, uh, what would they want to know about today? Or what would you want to tell them about your life? So King Tut had all these objects and that's how we kind of know about his life. So we can kind of write down um, things that they might not want to know about us. So are there any, some examples of things that you might want to talk about? Are there any questions you might have for a uh, future archeologist? So I kind of want to know, um, do we have flying cars in the future? That would be cool. Um, and then drop any ideas you have in the chat of things you want to write down. Um, I want to know if we have any flying cars, if we have traveled to Mars. That'd be I was cool. also going to ask that. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and then I want to also think about what sort of things would I want them to know about my life or what you would want to tell them about your lives. So. I'd want to tell them that I'm a student at U Chicago, um, that I'm from Ohio, and that I have two brothers. So make sure to write all these down. And then you can make sure uh, to also put your name at the top of the letter. I'm lucky because I, it's only me and I have no brothers or sisters. <laughs> that is pretty lucky. I am occasionally jealous of you. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and make sure to put your name at the top of the letter so that people uh, hundreds of years from now will know who wrote it. So what's one thing you learned about King Tut today? You can also write that. I learned that, I learned that he was nine years old when he became pharaoh. Somebody else said that they're going to write down some riddles for a future archaeologists to solve. That's pretty cool. Um, and then something or funny or interesting that happened today. Hmm. I think my interesting thing will be that I got to hang out with y'all on Zoom call and talk about King Tut. I got this box is this okay interesting i think that i'm gonna write is I, I was here when coronavirus was happening oh yeah that is very interesting is this box okay i think that box is 
Perfect. Yeah, that's awesome. And it can be it can be any box. Mine's mine's like a clear little Tupperware box, and just big enough that you can put a couple things in it. And then the last thing that I'm gonna write down is like what are some of my favorite things. So a bunch of examples. There's games, food, pieces of clothing, uh, favorite book. Hmm. Favorite book. I really like the Where the Wild Things Are picture book. It's a good one. And favorite color would be blue. And favorite animal is probably a zebra. So you can write all these things down and we're going to keep going. But if you want to keep writing your letter later, you can just continue doing that. And then also uh, for our time capsule, we need objects to put in it. We need things to put in it because that's what King Tut did, right? Um, so he had this golden sarcophagus that was really fancy. So we kind of know what he might have looked like. We also have that statue. So maybe you want to include a photo or a drawing of yourself in the time capsule. I have a photo that I'm going to put in of me with all my cousins. So I think that's going to go in my time capsule. Um, you can also draw a picture of yourself if you don't have a photo to put in. And if you don't have any of these things right now, don't worry. You can um, always find them after the program ends and keep making your time capsule. What else do you have um, in the um, OI other than the um, for King Tut, other than the King Tut statue? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Calgary, do you want to answer that? Yeah. Uh, so. There are a couple of things in the OI. So I showed those pictures of the pots uh, and dishes and then his astronomical instrument. But we actually don't have very much of King Tut's stuff in the OI. Most of his stuff is actually in Egypt. So when it was discovered, they kept it all in Egypt because it was so special that the Egyptian government wanted to keep it where it belonged. So sometimes this stuff tours around, but I think now they're going to open a museum that's basically just for the stuff in his tomb. So you'll have to go to Egypt someday to see all of the other stuff. Yeah, great. that was a great question. And um, for the time capsule, uh, we talked about the things that were in King Tut's tomb. So we also want to add other items that we think are important and archaeologists might want to find. So I'm going to add, um, I'm going to add a paintbrush to mine. And I'm going to add is blue marker because blue is my favorite color and I'll add hmm, I think I'll add this pen as well and we have all these different things in here because we want to find things that are important to us and that archaeologists can learn from us about so maybe they see the paintbrush and they think oh this person liked to paint and then when they know something about you so definitely don't put anything in there that you don't want to um lose or have so don't put your favorite stuffed animal in there if you don't want it to um be sealed in with this time capsule um charlie yeah um, okay. i don't know if my parents will let me put any s stuff in my, the box because all of the stuff that i have isn't um it's either it's either i really like and so i don't want to um lose it or it's going to have to be donated or it's not something i can put in the box yeah that's fair that's a good that's a good point ella um if you have anything really special that you want would want same. to include but don't want to give up you can always put in a picture of it or you could do draw a picture of it too so those are a couple other things if you don't want to physically put the object in yeah, so that's definitely. a very good point. Yeah, definitely ask your parents before you put anything special in there. Yeah, and I think drawing's a great idea. Picture's a great idea. I also just have a bunch of markers. So it's like a cheap and small thing that I can put in. That's the same with me, Ella. Yeah. Um, some other things would be coins you could put in if you have like bracelets that you like. Um, and then the last thing that you're going to do uh, so once you're done with assembling your items, and you can keep doing this later, so don't worry about doing this right now, but you, I want you to take a marker. So I'm going to take this blue marker and take it out of the box, out of the time capsule. And I'm going to write today's date on the outside of the time capsule. So there's like a little, I have a little thing that I can write on. 
And today's date is July 30th, 2020. And this is so archaeologists, years and years from now, will know what date your time capsule is from, and that way they can tell exactly uh, what time period you were living in at the time. So I know somebody mentioned coronavirus earlier, so that can be also something that you write like about. Why what? That was me. Um, my name in the Zoom is T S. Oh, hi. That was yeah. That was a great point, uh, T S. You can also talk about that or write that on your box. And then the final thing that you want to do is write the name of your favorite Egyptian god or goddess on the front of the time capsule so that they can protect it and make sure that it gets safe uh, to these future archaeologists. So I'm going to write, I think Horus is my favorite. King Tut is mine. Yeah? Is it Pharaoh? Yeah. Or yeah, you can write King Tut so that his his ghost protects it. Um, <laughs> Um, he was a god on earth, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and then once you're done doing all that, you want to, like, set it somewhere safe. Um, and if you uh, can either say, like, I'll open this in a year. Or if you want, you can try and make sure that, um, keep it somewhere really safe, and maybe archaeologists in 100 years can come and find it. Yeah. My suggestion is lose it in your closet or under your bed, and then maybe you'll find it in a couple years when you're doing a deep clean of your room. So just like how Tut's tomb was lost, that way you aren't tempted to open it anytime sooner. For over 100 years, the OI has been a leading research center for the study of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations. Join us in uncovering the past and learn about the beginnings of our lives as humans together. Become a member by visiting oi.uchicago.edu slash member.